bookish readers and empowers aspiring authors to write and publish their fiction and nonfiction stories. I'm Paige Davidson and co-hosting the show with me is my friend and author of 10,000 Miles with My Dead Father's Ashes, Devin Galladay. We are especially excited about today's very enlightening show. Um, it's in honor of Autism Awareness Month and to share her special perspectives, interesting perspectives on today's topics and on human libraries. She is an ASD advocate, an author, a writer, and she is big on TikTok. She creates content and she's a big presence there. In today's Author's Corner segment, we have Catherine Celery. CEO and founder of Conscious Parenting Revolution and author of seven strategies to keep your relationship with your kids from hitting a boiling point. Devin, I know I could have used that when my kids were little. <laughs> Absolutely. In the Writer's Corner segment, we have Dr. Wendy Labot, CEO of the Financial Cures LLC and creator of the Financial Cures System a results-based program for financial mastery. Dr. Labat is the best-selling author of the Financial Cures book series, Diagnose Your Financial Health and Optimize Your Financial Health. Devin, can you tell us about today's virtual library? I absolutely can, Paige. Our inspiring background is of the Central Library of Calgary. It is a new library that plays a vital role and can accommodate more than twice as many annual visitors as the faculty it replaced. The library is wrapped in a striking triple glazed facade composed of a module hexagonal pattern that echoes the library's efforts to welcome all visitors. The library boasts a generous 75,000 square feet of entry plaza and an outdoor amphitheater that allows its lively programming to spill outside. Inside, the program is organized on a spectrum ranging from fun to serious, and the library's more engaging public activities are featured on the ground floor, while quieter study areas can be found above. At street level, multi-purpose rooms ring the building to enhance connectivity with the outside, while the mezzanine hosts the children's library and its numerous playhouses. The whole building is encased in the same pattern, allowing every side to operate as the front of the library, and the same visual vocabulary plays a significant role in the library's new visual identity and wayfinding inside. Paige, what do you think? Oh, Devin, I can tell you, I have experience working in public libraries. I have experience working at the State Library of Kentucky. And I can tell you that that is not your grandmother's library. <laughs> <laughs> that is an amazing space from the outside. It looks modern and just contemporary and it invites you to come inside. And when you saw those pictures of the inside, that is a library that I want to be in. I want to visit. It's bright. It's open. It's welcoming. I'm an author. I want to write there. I want to do research there. That is where I want to be to do work. So I am so impressed by this library. I would love to visit. So I guess we have to book a, a, a trip to Calgary. I think we, we absolutely must. 
Thank you, Devin. Last week, you shared with us a really enlightening story of a gentleman um, named Reginald Dwayne Betts. He's a legal scholar, a writer, an advocate of education and prison reform. And he has the, the intention to build 1,000 libraries and prisons across the country. And we really encourage our viewers, if you did not see that episode, to please watch episode 14 at www.e360tv. Devin, you have another empowering and enlightening library uh, story on human libraries to share with us. Is that right? Yeah, I know. This is, I love this. This is so cool. So, okay. So the human library was developed in Copenhagen in the spring of 2000 as a project for the Roxgilde Festival by Ronnie Abergel and his brother Danny and colleagues Asma Mona and Christopher Erickson. The original event was open eight hours a day for four days straight and featured over 50 different titles. The broad selection of books provided readers with ample choice to challenge their stereotypes, and so they did. More than a thousand readers took advantage, leaving books, librarian organizers, and readers stunned at the impact of the human library. One of the creators, Ronnie Ebergel, realizing the potential of the idea, decided after the first event to begin to work to promote the idea to potential new organizers. Since then, he founded the Human Library Organization and produced a guide to new organizers with the Nordic Council of Ministers and the Council of Europe. He traveled to many countries to help train new local organizers, plan launch events, and uh, present the idea to inter interested organizations and public authorities. Today, it is estimated that the Human Library has been presented in more than 80 countries around the world, most of them in partnership with local organizers. Let's watch this enlightening video. We are bringing the Human Library Project to the University at Albany. This is the first time that we've had the Human Library Project here. Through this event, we are going to have human books tell stories to students about their own lives and how they've overcome struggles, stories of immigration, stories of uh, change and adaptation, stories from around the globe. Um, and so our goal is to uh, first of all, ensure that our students are forging important connections with our faculty and staff on campus. So that's really important to the work that I'm doing in undergraduate education. I am going to see Fardine's presentation today. Um, I've worked with and seen Fardine in separate capacities on campus, so I know that he's going to have a lot of good insight to offer. I know that he or his family comes from Middle Eastern descent, uh, what I believe is Iran. I think that it's going to offer some some cross-intersectionality between experienced uh, as, as uh, you know, foreign and maybe, I'm not sure if his family are immigrants, but, you know, wherever they come from, the differences that they see in American culture and Iranian culture. Thank you so much for having me here. I have to tell you, it's a, it's a privilege and it's a little bit of, of a nervousness because I'm never in front of students, the faculty are, so please bear with me. I escaped from Iran when I was 18 years old, uh, 1982. From at the age of 14 overnight, you know, I had to become an adult because the parents had to take my, my hope is they can hear my experience and next time when see, they see someone or hear someone that looks like me or sound like me, they put that in perspective. Our job at the university is to take away the prejudgments, the prejudices. Not that I'm saying exist at all, but maybe they will go and talk to that individual and learn from their life. I think it's a very interesting concept, especially in the days that people are moving away from the book and it's, everything is digital. To be a human book is even more wonderful. We paid um, professional smugglers. We came down all the way south Oh, southern part of Iran, which is the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Wow. 
Uh, so he has a very powerful um, triumphant story. I mean, it surpassed, you know, don't give up or push harder right off the bat. I, I didn't know what the Baha'i religion was. Um, so that this is that's a new kind of something I want to dive into and see the practices that they follow and, you know, the oppression that's been going on for the past, you know, almost coming on 200 years since 1844. You know, these are things that you'll never find in a book. Um, these are stories that you'll never read on paper. When you listen to a story and the way that it pulls at your heartstrings or the way that it touches you, um, and, and it's something that, you know, when you hear it coming from a voice itself, it's, it's much it's much different. But the, the, the library aspect of it, I, I can't imagine what a library of these stories would hold. I decided to come because I think that everyone's story is unique and different. A lot of times when we're in classes, you don't necessarily get to hear people's story or kind of understand where they're coming from. Just learn about others' perspectives, their story, um, you know, how they ended up being in the same space that they are here today. And I'm really glad I came actually because it really opened up your eyes to other people's lives. Um, it was almost like we were reading it, but instead we were just listening to it. The amount of like political violence that can stir more political violence, it kind of gives you an understanding as to why terrorism happens. Even though it got better, it's two steps forward and one step back. And we need to work on, um, on taking two steps forward and no steps back. I'm from uh, the west part of China. It's, it's a province called Sichuan. I do care about the health situation of everyone within a country. So I think there's an interesting topic here from a lecture studying the emergencies. So I just want to drop by and learn more about it. I think she's going to tell me about um, the recent study situation or tips for individual people how to escape during emergency event uh, situations. Uh, we all have different experience and we all have different values. I would say we just, we are who we are and we just learn from our past and we proceed in the future. Hopefully my story can encourage some students uh, in their past to pursue what they are passionate about doing. Uh, so I guess, yeah, my purpose here is just, yeah, if I could help, then it's my pleasure. You need to find yourself, uh, who you are and what you're good at, uh, what you are passionate about, and then pursue your dream. Yeah. Well, actually, I, it really impressed me a lot by her story because I was expected to learn some like scientific common knowledge about emergency, but it's not. It's really a human library stuff because everybody has their own story. She has overcome a lot to, to, to make it. That, that really encouraged me. We want to welcome Christelle to the to Bookish Talk today. And Christelle, can you take a moment? We just watched an amazing video on the Human Library Project. And I, we would love to hear your thoughts about that project and also about how you feel that it empowers individuals in the, in, in the autism spectrum to share their stories. Yes, absolutely. As a woman of color, specifically um, how autism presents um, in us um, based on cultural background and just whatever community we're in is quite different to what we see in the media and what's um, written about in papers. So I think human libraries are such a great way to have those varying um, life experiences and um, just, sorry, <laughs> to have those um, be known to everyone and it'll be great for research as well as other children of color and parents of color who may not um, know what the symptoms are and how to recognize that in their children and how to help them. So it, it would be, human libraries are absolutely wonderful. Um, for those I, on that I totally agree with you. I think they're an amazing way to connect with someone and with a different experience. Christelle, can you tell us what inspired you to write Salt and Savory, and what is the genre? The genre is actually adult romance, um, but from a very, um, instead of an escapist way, it's more of a walk in another person's shoes way. So it's kind of a role play. I saw there was a lack of diversity in this specific um, 
self-insert romance and I decided to um, write something, start a project, a series of self-insert romances for women of color to kind of be a part of that. So it includes people on the autism spectrum, different neurodivergences, um, sexualities, backgrounds, ethnicities, um, as a little bit of positive um, activism and advocacy um, instead of kind of the heavy stuff. So that's what inspired it. A bit of, a bit of fun for um, those that are of age, of course. <laughs> yeah, so Christelle, I love the way that you saw that need and you stepped up and you filled that need. So that's amazing. Devin, mm -hmm. can you tell us your perspective? Uh, you know, I think I think the human library idea is incredibly important because the truth of the matter is the more we get to know each other, the more uh, we close in on the path to unity. And I think that's really an important human quality. So I love it. I love that too. And I'm familiar with the Human Library Project, but I've not been lucky enough yet to, to experience it. But Devin, I'm moving across country in a couple of weeks and I commit, and I challenge you to commit to find the closest Human Library Project to where we both live and to go experience, in that, experience that. I'm going to do that for sure when I move. Done. Done. All right. Devin, last week you shared with our viewers how to write a book synopsis. Uh, this week, can you share with us the next step in uh, book publishing? Absolutely. A query letter is a one-page introduction that you send to an agent, an editor, or a publisher uh, asking for representation or request for work. Uh, query letters is a common part of many authors' careers. A well-written query letter can get the attention and interest of an agent or publisher, making it more likely for them to reach out to you for more information, hopefully a manuscript request. A uh, query letter is, a, a, is basically a pitch for work or idea to generate interest from agents and editors. The work uh, could be a novel, a magazine article, a nonfiction book. If an agent or editor believes they could publish your work, they may request the manuscript. That's the goal or a few chapters to determine if it could move forward. This letter functions as an important step towards getting written work published. We will discuss next week on how to write a query letter. Uh, and when we come back from break, we will talk with Dr. Wendy Labatt, the financial healer. when it comes to their life or health they're like okay i don't need that but it's like that's the most important because if you're down your money is down And you, you have, have to have, have knowledge. knowledge, you know, you don't have, you to, know have to know everything, everything but there's some basics, some basics that you basics need, to, you know. need to, know. to know. And the more yeah, you the know, more the you better. Know, the better. corner. We have a serious mission here at Bookish Talk, and that is to enlighten, encourage, and empower as inspiring authors like Christelle to continue writing and publishing their stories by inviting these best-selling authors here to our club to share their story and, and their journey. Devin, could you introduce Dr. Wendy Labatt and share her amazing bio with our viewers? It would be my pleasure. Dr. Wendy Labatt, the financial healer, is the CEO of the Financial Cures LLC and creator of the Financial Cure System, a results-based program for financial mastery. Dr. Labatt is the best-selling author of the Financial Cures book series, Diagnose Your Financial Health and Optimize Your Financial Health. 
She is the producer of the award-winning global streaming production of Financial Cures with Dr. Wendy Labatt, a award-winning entrepreneur, business strategist, and international speaker, Dr. Wendy empowers entrepreneurs, corporate executives, and individuals to overcome anorexic income, obese debt, spending addictions, mindset, and knowledge deficiencies, and other financial ills to optimize their financial life, enjoy financial freedom, and live the life they desire. Dr. Labatt is the founder and CEO of the Ascend Foundation, a 501c3 organization established to empower disadvantaged women to realize their dreams of entrepreneurship. Dr. Wendy Labatt has her Doctor of Business Administration in entrepreneurship and almost four decades of experience as an entrepreneur. Dr. Wendy, hey, talk. <laughs> how are you? And thank you for having me. I'm so glad that you're here. We're going to jump in because we have a lot of questions. Okay. Wendy, what are your thoughts about the Human Library Project? It's kind of exciting, right? It is. I love it because it, it gives you a chance to hear stories that you wouldn't or automatically resonate with or really look into in a book. You know, you're going to hear from people that not only tell their story, but it allows you to hear their tone, their watch their body language and also just empathize with their situation, which gives you just a better perspective versus, you know, reading a book and having your own biases and things. So I really love it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, obviously, but let's let's now get to you. Okay. What inspired you to empower others on financial literacy? Well, um, I'm a breast cancer conqueror and because, and I'm also, you know, I have a tax preparation business, a health uh, insurance business. So I see folks, you know, struggling and suffering financially, mainly because they don't know what they're doing and they don't, it's not that they don't want to do better. It's just, they don't know how to do better. So after my um, situation with, you know, conquering breast cancer, it left me in a position and really God said, look, you're going on a crusade to empower other people to get their money right. So that's how I got into that uh, as far as helping other folks. But it's, you know, it's just that especially now we're in, you know, an awful economy and people are really struggling. So, you know, it's, I'm on my crusade. I'm just being obedient to the mission that I've been assigned to. So what makes the Financial Cures book series unique, perhaps, than other concepts? Well, you know, you mentioned financial literacy, and I take it from a financial health perspective because, you know, people kind of confuse and conflate financial health with financial literacy. But you can be financially literate and still have poor and sometimes fatal financial health. And people kind of close off when you talk about, you know, like insurance and they don't want to hear about insurance, but if you say proper protection, they're a little more receptive to hearing about it. People don't want to budget. They don't want to hear about a budget, but if you say plan where your money goes, you know, instead of wondering where it went, they're like, okay, I think I can do that. And then when you talk about anorexic income and obese debt and spending addictions, they can kind of relate to that better than saying, you know, you don't have any money and you in debt, you know, so those kind of things. So it's more of a play on words to kind of get people to open up their minds to, you know, enhance their mindset because a lot of everybody wants more money, but they don't have the mindset to handle it. So you can't, you know, want a rich man's wealth and have a, a poor man's mentality. So that's, you know, what makes mine different. It's more of a financial health type thing which still, you know, results in you doing better with your finances. So as an author, what did you learn about the writing and publishing process? Well, I learned that it's not as difficult as it seems. And the thought, <laughs> and I fretted more about the process than the actual process. The process ended up being, as, you know, a lot easier than I thought. And it's not as difficult. You know, people want to write books, but I think if they understood the process and, you know, you, you're talking about that in your uh, platform. And I think that helps folks understand. Now, I ended up self-publishing, um, but, you know, I met publishers after I had already published my second book. But it's not as difficult, you know, a story 
can be told. And that's what I like about the human library uh, project, because, you know, whether you have your book in writing or not, if you can tell it and people can listen to it, that's that's awesome. So I, I just learned it's not as difficult for me, at least it wasn't um, as I thought it would be. Young readers are posting their book reviews on Book Talk, and authors and publishing companies are pivoting uh, their marketing on Book Talk. So, besides public speaking, what are some alternative ways to market our books? Well, what I found a book for me, what how I've used mine and marketed is, you know, I've been on podcasts and everything, but I give my books away. You know, I give it when I go to events, you know, I give them, you know, more like business cards because people, I want them to get the knowledge. I want them to get the understanding, you know, and it's not all about selling books for me, even though, hey, I want to sell some, but it's, I like I said, I'm on this crusade. So, you know, my clients, my tax clients, my healthcare clients, I send them a book you know, at once we're done so they can know what to do. Because I tell, especially my tax clients, I tell them what to do year after year, but they don't always do it. Some of them do, but some of them don't. But when I give them the book and it's an easy read, they come back and say, wow, Wendy, I enjoyed your book. I learned so much and it wasn't as difficult as I thought. So, you know, it's a, a guide that they can use or a tool that they can use. So that's one way for me. <laughs> and then two, as you know, a contributing factor to or an incentive for folks. You know, if I you know do an event, I'll you know give books away. Especially depends on what the audience is. But I think you know being more willing to get away from promoting the sale of the book versus promoting the content of the book. And you know, like I said, the podcast and and if I'm on a podcast, I usually send the presenter, you know, copies of the book, you know, prior to sometime, but I don't always get to get it out. But even afterward, as an appreciation, you know, gift to let them know that I appreciate them giving me the opportunity. And then once they read it and they talk about it, you know, word of mouth is like the grapevine, you know, that spreads like wildfire. So uh, I think those are some good ways for me that I've utilized. Hi, Wendy. How are you today? Doing great. Thank you very much for joining us today. I have a Wall Street background, so I, I love talking about this. Thank you very much for what you do to help people. But let's let's talk about uh, writers, though. The, the, uh, the most common ethnicity of authors is white, and that is followed by Hispanic or Latino at 7.2 percent. The white the white is 79.4 percent. The Hispanic or Latino, 7.2%, and the Black or African American is 5.8%. How can we improve these numbers, and how can Bookish support your mission? Well, I think the numbers can be improved by exposure to the process. You know, a lot of times in underserved communities, you talk about writing a book, it's like, you know, they think it's beyond their reach. But once they get a feel for it and... Now it's, you know, you don't have to be as formal about your writing as back in the day. You know, you had to cross every T and dot every I, but now you don't have to do that. And I love the, was it the book talk platform? Because that's where this generation is. And that's where social media, especially in the black community, is really kind of taken over. People would rather watch it then read it. So I think that's an awesome way to encourage people to like, okay, I can do this, you know, TikTok or book talk, you know, uh, presentation. And then if they realize they can convert that into an actual written book, I think that will help improve the numbers. Thank you very much for joining us today, Wendy. Uh, when we come back from break, we will have a conversation with Catherine Celery in our writer's corner. An enlightening quote by Albert Einstein. Strive not to be a success, but to be of value. Encourage, enlighten, empower. I think we just have to step back and really take a moment in order to be conscious about 
Whether we're living the lives that we want to live and we're actually being who we want to be with our children, modeling the behaviors that we'd like them to be able to look to when they're looking for support around how to be. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to speak up even if it makes other people uncomfortable. And you know what? If I get to rock the boat, well, so be it. I will overcome my programming. It's taken me almost my entire life to do it. Believe in yourself. Trust yourself. Believe in your inner voice. You can do it. You know, what's an okay amount for a child to be on the screen or gaming a day? I have the honor of supporting families in creating either the opportunity to get to the front side of their parenting so that the problems don't happen, or if the problems have already happened, to know that they can create the change that they want. Because everybody's, I really believe, doing the best they can. You're now a teacher. Um, and, you know, you're getting to do the disciplinarian stuff that a teacher would normally be doing for you all day long on top of everything else. And who has the bandwidth? Catherine Celery teaches parents how to change their anxious or depressed child's physiology in order to clear through the different emotional states. So there are ways that we can clear through the energy of emotion other than talk therapy other than drug therapy. So we need to learn it and we need to teach our children to learn it because you can see already how we respond to everything depends on what we think about our feelings. So what we must recognize is that children need our compassion the most when they appear to deserve it the least. Welcome to the Writer's Corner. Our mission at Bookish is to encourage, enlighten, and empower inspiring authors to write and publish their story. Our next guest is Catherine Celery, CEO and founder of the Conscious Parenting Revolution. She helps individuals minimize misunderstandings and meltdowns in order to communicate with more collaboration, cooperation, and consideration creator of the Guidance Approach to Parenting, a program that applies conflict resolution skills to communicating more effectively with children. Kathleen has positively influenced relationships for generations and brought about healing and reconciliation in families that were suffering from disconnection. For over 20 years, she has taught and coached thousands of parents, educators, social workers, and medical professionals in half a dozen countries through her popular workshops, coaching programs, TED Talks, 250 page comprehensive training manual, and ebook. Welcome, Catherine, to Bookish Talk. Thank Thanks you. It's so great to be here. Yes, I'm enjoying listening to the stories. So, Catherine, what are your thoughts about the Human Library Project? This is something for us that is really exciting. Um, do you have any idea or thought about it? Well, I, I'm just, for real, honestly, just getting exposed right now, and I loved what I saw. Um, it made me think of Harry Potter. <laughs> when, you know, the pictures come alive, and now the books are coming alive. And that is so awesome for a book to come alive. It's so much more animated, so much more engaging, so much more, you know, that it can bring someone in to deeply understand another's um, experience and life from their shoes. So what inspired you personally to found the Conscious Parenting Revolution? Because it sounds like an incredible undertaking. Yeah. Um, you know, it's my life story. Of course, we all have, you know, probably ended up where we are because of something about our own upbringing. That's the power of the past, the power of our families of origins to sculpt us and, you know, kind of decide this is going to be your PhD in life. You're going to overcome these things and be able to share your journey with the rest of the world. So uh, I think for me, it was really my family of origin and uh, his, mine, and our family where my mom had her kids, my dad had his kids, they had us, and we were all together and there was a lot of conflict. There was a lot of love. There was a lot of mess. It was everything. Um, but in particular, there were dynamics that as a child watching and observing only as the adult who can put them in perspective, could I understand how much harm was done by the absence of skilled communication? It just needed skills. It wasn't that anybody was good, bad, right, wrong. It was that they were lacking in the ability to connect with their own inner sense of things in a way in which they weren't merged with them. 
so that there was space between the feeling not to be the feeling, but to be with the feeling, to be able to understand the connection between the feelings and underlying unmet needs, to be able to be with their inner world in a way in which their inner world didn't overwhelm them. And I don't know about you guys, but there was nobody in my family of origin who even had the language to talk about the inner and the outer world, who even had a context for understanding their own feelings and needs or the vocabulary, who even had a worldview that could put you know, all of it in the context of getting bigger than what's bugging you and having a sense of self that was larger than our inner experiences. I don't know about you, but for me, the conscious parenting revolution is going to transform the way children grow up and how they relate within themselves to themselves and the, the other, whoever the other may be, whether it's a parent or another authoritarian figure or someone possibly who's more egalitarian. But how do I relate as a child and overcome ageism? The unconscious, you know, is unfortunately skewed so that children's perspectives are minimized, their feelings are minimized, their worlds are minimized because it doesn't comfortably fit within the perspective of what an adult thinks they should be thinking, feeling, or doing. So I call it, you know, ageism because unfortunately children are people too, but people don't see them as people too. I, I think it's some incredible work that you're doing. Uh, in, 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 in terms of, uh, being a writer and an author, was there any fears or adversities that you experienced and how did you overcome them to get your work out there? You know, it took a lifetime to really get pen to paper and, you know, to really be able to create the programs and the books and the workbooks and all of it, because I really do think of it as a life's work. So there was so much inside of me that wasn't clear, so much I didn't understand about myself. So it's a process of really growing up and being able to get to the point where I had enough clarity that I could share it with somebody else and it would land. So it was more about that than um, anything else and getting to the place where I could feel within myself that I had enough clarity to be able to say it clearly enough and concisely enough that it would land for another person in a way that it could serve them. Oh, wow, Kathleen, I really resonate with that. Um, and I do agree with um, teaching children skills and having that access, especially with the ageism. Um, um, as a mm -hmm. teacher, um, former teacher, I saw a lot of that. Um, so I want to ask you why and how do parents, teachers, coaches, and mentors empower young people to begin the process of writing and publishing their stories? Mm. You know, I guess a lot of it is that idea that what I have to share is valuable. I think a lot of it is the psychological piece that, you know, I am enough. Um, my story is valuable and it can make a contribution to serve. So once we start thinking about, is there even just one person for whom my story might serve them in a way that gives them some greater access to liberation within themselves, then why would I not? Why would I with, you know, withhold my story from that service that it could provide? Mm -hmm. And that mindset, I think it's always, you know, when you get right back down to it, it's the mindset piece of, you know, oh, I'm not enough, or I'm not smart enough, or I'm not this enough, or the other enough, that, that it's valuable for me to take the time and to really share. And so if you can switch it into, will it be of service? Will it somehow contribute? Then, you know, would you want to be able to serve your community? Would you want to be able to serve humanity? Then maybe with that empowering sense of I'm in service to others, it brings us to the point of, well, you know, my, maybe for myself, I'm not empowered enough to do it, but to serve others, I will. Welcome, Catherine. Hi, what, Sarah. A, what a powerful mission. Mature children grow up to be mature adults. How's that for a concept? What a beautiful thing right. you're doing. Uh, but I want to get back to your, your, your uh, speaking and authoring world. Um, how has becoming an author and a TEDx speaker empowered your mission? Hmm. 
Well, a lot, um, because, you know, the TED stage is one of the best ways to get ideas that are worth sharing out there. And so, you know, I was so fortunate to have three different stages that in, wanted to include me in their program. And every one of those stages, I don't even know, I'd have to go look myself, but I, I know it's hundreds of thousands of views of those talks, each one of them. And so wow. before you know it, you've touched hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, which is a really powerful way to create a movement. And we need to be able to share the message and have people experience a new perspective around parenting and around really discipline, because my conversation is around conflict resolution, where a lot of parents are not empowered to know that if you're insisting someone do something and they don't, you do this to them, that that opens up a whole can of worms and it activates retaliation, rebellion, and resistance. And then 75% of our problems are actually the secondary issues. So if we want to get away from spending all of our time dealing with the three R's that were activated by the way we handled the primary problems, we have to find another way to communicate and resolve conflict. And so... We got to get started. And, and, you know, the implications across the universe are profound, profound. Exactly. And it's, it's really sad because what you realize is that we're creating judgmental people and that's what you're having to undo, which is unfortunate. But uh, I tell you what, can you, can you briefly share a story uh, that will encourage others to read more and different genres of books and write and eventually publish their story. Well, when you're asking for me to share a story, do you want me to share a story from my book? Or would you like me to share a st something that I talk about? It's something along those lines or? Something that will encourage others. Uh, your story is probably the best encouragement. I know my story is the best that I can tell, but so your story is probably the best that you could tell. <laughs> sure, let me tell a story, which is really the um, one that I love to tell. I think I tell it both in my book and the TED Talk, and it's about bridging the, the ageism. And it had to do with, we would come back, we've been in Hong Kong for 32 years. We just came back to the US recently. And so my kids were born and raised there and we'd bring them back to the States in the summertime to hang out with the grandparents. And we were here at my parents' house. And I said, dad, could you watch Pia, my five or six year old daughter? Uh, I've got to go run some errands. Okay, sure, honey, I'm happy to do that for you. So I left and dad and my daughter were together and he was about 80 and she was about five. And so there's a huge, huge difference in how he approaches discipline and how I approach discipline. And so when I came back, I said, dad, where's Pia? And he said, well, I sent her to, my, I sent her to her room. Why? Well, she was disrespectful. Oh my gosh. Well, okay. I mean, what happened? Well, I made lunch and I told her it was time for lunch and she ignored me and she'll learn to respect her grandpa. So I've sent her to her room and she'll, she can sit there until she understands that she needs to respect her elders. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay, well, let me go down and talk to her. And she was crying in a room. She'd never had a time out in her life. We never resolved problems by punishing people. We talked through the issues. And so I was like, Pia, oh my gosh, what's going on? And she was sobbing. I don't know, mommy, I don't know. I was just finishing my drawing. And then grandpa started yelling and getting so mad at me. I just, I don't even know what I did wrong. Oh my gosh, sweetie. Well, let's go up and see if we can work this out with grandpa. So I sat between my 80 year old dad and my five or six year old daughter. And I said, you know, you guys have really had a breakdown, you know, dad, could you tell me what's going on for you? And well, she needs to learn how to, how to respect her grandpa. When I call her for lunch, then she needs to come. And I said, okay. So you feel like Pia was disrespectful? Yes. Oh, okay. So Pia, grandpa said he called you for lunch and that you were disrespectful. Do you know what that means? And she said, no, mommy, I was just finishing my drawing. Oh, okay. So I turned to my dad and I said, gosh, dad, she doesn't even know what the word means, but she was just finishing her drawing. I think you guys have had a huge breakdown in communication. And I said, I hope we can work this out. And I got up and left. And a few hours later, my dad came to me at 80 something and said, honey, it's a better way. 
that whole spare the that whole spare the rod spoil the child concept I think is uh, is about over. <laughs> that that's how I was raised. I, I could understand that, but we're we're moving past that. I, I love that giving kids respect. Exactly, that's what we're learning to do here. Catherine, thank you very much for joining us. What an exciting story. Um, Bookish Talk is sponsored by Pivot Point School for Entrepreneurs. When you are ready to pivot from employment to entrepreneurship, they will point you in the right direction. So what you want to do is visit thrivingwomennetwork.com to learn more about their 10-week online certification course and scholarship program that starts April 23rd. Uh-oh. <laughs> when we come back from, from break in the Bookish Club, we will share our book recommendations. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi, my name is Emily. Lots of times writers can feel like anyone who is outside of the writing and publishing industry has no idea what they're going through. If I had a dollar for every time someone asked me, are you going to publish your book? I would be rich. It can seem like people on the outside don't understand the process of book publishing at all, but that's because they really don't. I've written some query letters before, but I want to say right now that I've never gotten a positive response to one of my query letters from a publisher or an agent. Rather than making this video to tell you how awesome my query letters are and how great I am at writing them, I just wanted to compile a few tips on writing query letters that we can all follow and learn from. And next time someone asks you, are you going to publish that book? You can send them right here to this video to help them understand the difficult process that's ahead of you. So the first thing you want to do when you are setting out to write a query letter for your novel or your picture book manuscript or whatever else you may be writing, you want to do your research and make sure that you're going to be querying agents and publishers who are interested in the kind of book that you have written, whether it's a publisher that publishes children's books or memoirs or adult novels or an agent who represents books that are in the same genre as yours. You'll have to compose a pitch for your book and a snappy bio for the author. That's you. If the agent or editor you are submitting to is named on the publisher's website, you'll want to address your letter directly to that person. Make sure you check each separate publisher's submission guidelines. Almost every publishing house, agent, or editor has their own preferences for what they want to receive from you and how they want it to be formatted. If you don't follow their guidelines, the chances are they're not going to read your query letter at all. For instance, many publishers that accept email submissions won't open attachments, so you need to tell them everything that they need to know about you and your book in the body of your email. On the other hand, a great many publishers don't accept submissions by email at all, and you'll have to send them the old-fashioned way through snail mail. If you do this, make sure you include a SACE, which is a self-addressed stamped envelope, that is, if you are expecting to hear back from them. Even if there's something about your work that they like or they're interested in, if you haven't included an envelope for them to put their response in and put it in the mail to send back to you, they're not going to take the time to address an envelope to you or pay for the postage to send it. One of the most daunting things to keep in mind when it comes to querying agents and publishers is that they receive thousands of unsolicited submissions every year. Unsolicited means submissions that are coming from the author themselves rather than from an author who is represented by an agent. Because they're getting so many submissions, it can take a really long time for them to get back to you. Every publisher, agent, or editor, again, is going to have their own timeline, but you can safely expect that response times are going to be anywhere between two and six months. If you have any other tips for writing a query letter, snagging that agent's attention as soon as they open your envelope, leave them in the comments below. If my videos have been helpful or enjoyable to you and you haven't already, please click the little subscribe button down below. Also, if you have any questions that I should discuss about writing or suggestions for topics for future videos, please let me know in the comments below or you can tweet me at Ivy Long in a Book. As always, thank you so much for watching. Cheers. Welcome back to Bookish Talk. 
if you are a fan of books and particularly our show, then you know that this is the segment where we share our personal book recommendations with the goal of encouraging you to venture outside of your comfort zone, explore new ideas, concepts, genres. There's so many books, so many fantastic things that will change your life. So with that said, why don't we jump into this week's recommendations? Uh, and let's start with Christelle. Hi, I'm going to recommend my own self-published novel, novella, excuse me, it's quite short. Um, Salt and Savor is a self-insert adult romance, and it follows a therapist who goes on a few days of vacation before uh, visiting her family and is come face to face with her high school nemesis. So it's kind of a journey of um, facing your past, healing from past trauma, and then ending with a little happily ever after. So if you're into adult romances, if you're into healing, and if you want to step into someone else's shoes for around 140 pages, then this is the book for you. Thank you, Christelle. Tim, I know you got a winner for us this week. What's What say you? We can't hear you, Tim. Along the lines of my past recommendations, this is the House of Morgan, another biography. And let me begin by discussing Ron Chernow. He was also the author of my Alexander Hamilton book. He's written about J.D. Rockefeller. He's one of the most uh, eloquent and thorough biography writers of our time. And so this is a very extensive book that he's written. And if you're not familiar with the House of Morgan, it's J.P. Morgan, the people, not J.P. Morgan, the bank. John Pierport Morgan, senior and junior were actually two of them. And I just want to real quickly go through three quick stories about actually senior, the first two. But J.P. Morgan senior was so financially powerful that in the late 1800s, we had a financial crisis in this country that he was the one and only person in the history of our capitalist system that one person actually saved our federal financial system. And he did it by himself. That's never happened before and it will never happen since that one person can have that financial power. Second is railroads. He was a big investor in railroads. And to give you a sense of what they were doing in the 1800s is they were building parallel tracks. So like from New York to Boston, they would build multiple tracks from different companies and they would compete similar to having toll roads right next to each other. And what JP Morgan did is he locked, he, he invested in railroads. So he took all of the head of all these railroad companies and locked them in his library. And he said, you guys are not leaving until you fix this problem. That's how powerful he was. And then the third story, if you're not familiar with the history of our financial system, commercial and investment banks used to actually coexist. It was one bank, actually. And one of the reasons why that was split up is because of J.P. Morgan. That's why J.P. Morgan Chase is the commercial bank, while Morgan Stanley, if you're familiar with the investment banking world, was J.P. Morgan's investment side. And then finally, one of the fascinating things I've learned about these stories is they generally the very first 10 to 25 percent of the book is them building the business the rest of all of these biographies that i've written is them basically spending what they've earned and those stories of some of these he was called a robber baron which was a title given to these captains of industry in the late 18 and early 1900s who basically were able to monopolize the, their, their financial hold and get, gain unsightly profits so the stories after these guys became successful are often more fascinating than what made them successful. Love this book. Highly recommend if you guys are into these kind of books to pull this one up and read The House of Morgan by Ron Chernow. Thank you, Devin. Thanks, Tim. So my book is The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, which is a book that came out in 2000, something like that, like you know, 20, 20 years ago. Uh, it's the winner of the Pulitzer Prize. And let me just read a little excerpt from it. Houdini's first magic act, you know, back when it was just getting started, would, was called metamorphosis. It was never just a question of escape. It was also a question of transformation. The truth is that as a kid, Sammy had only casual interest, at best, in Harry Houdini and his legendary feats. His great heroes were Nikola Tesla, Louis Pasteur, and Jack London. Yet, 
His account of his role, of the role of his own imagination in the escapist birth, like all of the best fabulations rang true, his dreams had always been Houdini-esque. They were the dreams of a pupa struggling in its blind cocoon, mad for a taste of light and air. And um, this is, for me, just wonderfully, wonderfully written. Obviously, ha having won a Pulitzer Prize kind of says it all to, to many degrees. But it's a story that sort of has everything. It's about two cousins who start a comic book company. It becomes very successful. But it's really about relationships. It's really about, uh, uh, you know, people. And it's wonderfully done. I don't want to give too much of, a, of it away, but the language and the writing is absolutely first rate. It's a wonderful book. Uh, it's fairly thick. Uh, but that said, there was a point where I realized I had to slow read it. In other words, I kind of limited myself to read like two or three pages at a time, and that was it. So I could kind of make the book last longer. So when we come back, or should I say, we're going to be back. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, before we... The human library was absolutely fantastic. I love this idea of having these human books. I talked to a refugee, I talked to a feminist, I talked to a vegan. Male to female, transgender, um, lesbian, and atheist. I have checked out um, Pagan. I checked out Nahid. She is a woman who is Muslim. I felt this was a very respectful way to get to understand people that you might see but you might not know their story or their challenges. It has given me so much to think about. Mark Twain once said that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. But not everybody can travel around the world and meet people from these faraway places or who come from different walks of life. The library has always been a place where you can travel beyond without ever leaving. You learn a lot about the different communities that are in Owensboro and you learn more about their lives. My experiences with the people who checked me out were very positive. Um, there were some things that we actually had in common. They had some questions that they we're too afraid to ask anyone else that they're like, oh man, I feel so comfortable talking to you. It's something you'll definitely get something out of, just being able to share in your own experiences that you may not in your everyday, day-to-day -day life have the opportunity to talk about. It was just really, really neat. I had to explain to a 12-year-old girl what feminism was for the first time, so that was like really exciting. Yeah, I would love to do it again. It was really fun. Wonderful, and I'm looking forward to participating again, hopefully. If you didn't get to make it this time, come the next time. It's well worth the time. Definitely come. I, I just feel like there was so much information, and you can't get this in everyday life. Come and come early so you can meet as many people as you possibly can. We need this in our community, and we need to reach out to the people who maybe are scared or they don't understand, and to bring them in to say, Hey, we are humans. If you haven't met anyone that's, you know, that lives a different lifestyle or from a different background, has a different gender, or goes through stuff that you don't go through, just talk to them, you know? <laughs> Maybe it'll help you, especially nowadays with so much discrimination and hatred and stuff going on. Most of the people are so hateful and discriminatory because they don't know anyone. You know, once you meet someone and you realize, hey, these are just people just like me. You wouldn't believe how much it would change your life. So we at Bookish Talk really encourage you, our viewers, to experience lots of different categories of literature and books, lots of different genres. You may have a, a, a passion for reading, but none of us don't, you know, know what we don't know. And so if you have really limited yourself to only one or two genres of literature, you may end up writing in, in a genre that doesn't best suit you or your voice or your skills as a writer. And so when you when you 
love and explore all the different genres of, of reading and literature, you, you hear new voices, you read new books and get new ideas. And so we really want to encourage you to expand your horizons and, and check out lots of different kinds of genres as you are reading and exploring and to get exposed to some different kinds of genres, watch recent episodes on E360 TV. Absolutely. And as always, we want to thank you for joining us on Bookish Talk. We sincerely hope that we said something. And we did. We said so many good things that will encourage, enlighten, and empower you to begin your journey to write your legacy book or your first magazine article or whatever it is. Be sure to join us, uh, our bookish club, and begin the journey to journal. Tune in next week when we will share more tips on queries and doing other things that are bookish. Visit our website at www.thrivingwomennetwork.com and subscribe and leave a comment or question. And you never know when it may end up being answered on our show. Thanks for being here. Thank you.